A topic that I'll often hear people struggle with when they're first getting started with ML is all the different binary classification metrics out there. There are so many of them. What are the differences between them and the various use cases for each one? Well, keep watching because we're going to break all of that down. I'm Richard and this is Richard on Data. Now in this video, I'm going to illustrate these metrics using a data set called the Pima Indians Diabetes data set. It's a pretty simple data set. It's got eight different features in it. It's got things like pregnancies, glucose, blood pressure, and it's got a target variable. That target is equal to one if the patient had diabetes and zero otherwise. So again, it's pretty simple, but it's enough for us to make a model with. Now, this data set's totally free. You can find it on Kaggle. So in this video, I'm gonna go over prevalence, confusion matrices, accuracy, sensitivity or recall, specificity, positive predictive value or prevalence, F1 score, and the areas under the precision recall or ROC curves. We're gonna go over what all these are, their use cases, as well as how to implement these pretty simply in Python. If all that sounds good to you, smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I know at least 70 to 80% of you who watch my content are not subscribed, so please subscribe if you haven't already. So let's start with prevalence. And now, this one isn't even a measurement of the performance of your classifier. It's actually just a basic descriptive characteristic of your outcome variable. So basically, how prevalent is the positive class? In our diabetes example, we have 768 rows for our outcome variable. And of those 768, 268 are equal to one, again, meaning the subject has diabetes, and 500 are equal to zero, the subject doesn't have diabetes. What that means is the mean of our outcome variable, or equivalently our prevalence here, is 0.35. Now, if this were equal to 0.5, we'd say we had perfectly balanced labels. And unfortunately, there's not really any clean cutoff between what's balanced data and what's imbalanced. I will say in the real world, imbalance is as bad as 0.1, sometimes going as bad as 0.01 are not uncommon at all. So at 0.35 with this data, that's not terrible. Now for these next few examples, we really have to hammer home what we're looking at in what's known as a confusion matrix. And the basic premise here is, if we have binary classes and we're making a binary prediction, we really have four distinct possibilities. Here's what the format of a confusion matrix looks like. And the first outcome to speak of is the true positive. That is, the actual class is positive and we predict positive. In our case, those are the people with diabetes that the model predicts as having diabetes. Now, the other correct possibility is the true negative. The actual class is negative, but we predict negative. They didn't have diabetes, and the model correctly predicted that they didn't have diabetes. But then you've got a false positive. The actual class is negative, but we still predict positive. That is, the subject didn't have diabetes, but we predicted that they did. Similarly, there's the false negative. The actual class is positive, but our model predicts negative. They actually have diabetes, but we predicted that they didn't. So our first metric to discuss here is sensitivity, which is also known as recall. Now, this is the count of true positives over all positives. Or to put that another way, it's the percentage of the positive class that the model is able to identify. So if you think about our example, think about all the people who have diabetes. It's the percentage of them that the model was able to correctly identify as diabetic. Now, when do you prioritize sensitivity? Well, actually, it's pretty easy to imagine that in our case here, because of the diabetic population, if we end up misidentifying them, those people are pretty likely not to get the care that they need, so they're going to get worse outcomes. We're probably, in most cases here, going to want to identify as many of the diabetic patients as possible, meaning sensitivity is something we probably want to prioritize and pay attention to. Then you've got specificity. So specificity is the number of true negatives over all negatives. That is false positives plus true negatives. So 
This is basically measuring the correct identification of the other class. That is, of the patients out there without diabetes, what percentage of them were we able to correctly identify as not diabetic? And now what I'll say about specificity, it's probably a bit rarer to prioritize this compared to things like sensitivity or even precision, which we're covering next, but it does happen. So again, in our case, you might imagine it's pretty good to be able to tell people that they don't have a chronic condition like diabetes. So it's definitely something you at least want to look at. So now let's think back to sensitivity for a second, where we had the percentage of the subjects with diabetes that the model correctly identified. Now imagine you exactly flip that. That is, of the times that the model predicted someone to have diabetes, how often was that actually the case? Well, that measurement is positive predictive value, that is, precision. This is equal to the number of true positives over all predicted positives, that is, true positives plus false positives. And again, this is super important in a wide variety of cases, and it's pretty easy to imagine how it could be important here. For instance, you only have so much attention and care and staff that can be paid to people. It's really costly to give that care to people. And so if you're hearing that somebody has diabetes, ideally you would like that signal to be true. So again, positive predictive value is something we want to pay attention to. And so while I've been talking here, you might have been thinking, well, true positives and true negatives are both different types of correct predictions. Do we care about the total percentage of the time that we get a correct prediction? And if so, then you're thinking about accuracy. So accuracy is equal to true positives plus true negatives divided by all possible cases. And so, yeah, there are some times where we want to report this. It's not a totally useless metric. But the problem with accuracy is when we have a really imbalanced data set because it can often paint an incredibly overly rosy picture. So let's imagine that we're working with a spam data set where 1% of emails are spam and 99% of emails are not spam. Then let's suppose you made a really silly model that just predicts no emails are spam. Well, you would be correct 99% of the time, and so 99% would be the purported accuracy of the model, but such a model would be completely useless. That's sort of the whole motivation why we look at a lot of the metrics that we do here. Now also to be fair with accuracy, it's used a lot in comparing different candidate models to each other so that one model can be selected. It's just used significantly less for reporting the model's overall predictive capability. Also, to some extent, you can use the case I made with accuracy using an extreme exaggerated example to poke holes in all of these metrics. So for instance, if you make a model that predicts everyone has diabetes, your sensitivity is going to be 100%. And similarly, if you predict no one has diabetes, then your specificity is going to be 100%. So you see that these metrics are very sensitive to what threshold you pick. For example, if you set a model to predict a positive class, if the probability of that positive class is 10% or higher, your confusion matrix is going to look radically different than if your model were to predict the positive class if it found that probability of positive was 50% or higher. Now this is really where you start to see we need some sort of balanced metrics. Because there's an inverse relationship between sensitivity and specificity, as well as between sensitivity and positive predictive value. That is, between recall and precision. If that all seems like a weird concept, just imagine this in the context of our diabetes data. Just imagine we willy-nilly just start predicting more people to have diabetes. So we are going to flag more of our diabetic population, so we are going to see sensitivity go up, but of those more people that we start flagging, we're going to start seeing more and more false positives. That is, you're going to see your precision start to go down. And then similarly, of people who don't have diabetes, we're going to tell more of them that they do have diabetes wrongly. So you're going to see specificity start to fall as well. 
This is where we start to get really interested in metrics that measure the performance of our classifier, balancing these competing interests. So that's where we get metrics like the F1 score or the areas under two different primary kinds of curves. So let's start with the F1 score. Now the F1 score is equal to the harmonic mean between precision and recall. So it's really a sort of weighted average between the two. F1 score is calculated as a two over the inverse of recall plus the inverse of precision. To put that another way, it's equal to two times precision times recall over precision plus recall. Or again, equivalently, it's equal to two times true positives over two times true positives plus false positives plus false negatives. Now the problem you're going to run into with some of these balancing metrics is that there's not really a good cutoff for what's good and what's bad. Naturally, an F1 score equal to one would be perfect and equal to zero would be perfectly wrong. There's not a ton you can say beyond that because it is pretty sensitive to the class imbalance. And now this brings me to my favorite metrics of all, which is the areas under the curves. And there are two key curves to know about. Those are the receiver operating characteristic curve, or ROC curve, and the precision recall curve. Now, these curves and the area under them tell a tremendous story about the overall performance of your classifier. So let's start with the ROC curve. With the ROC curve, you've got false positive rate on the x-axis and true positive rate on the y-axis. What you're essentially doing is looking how well your classifier can balance sensitivity and specificity. And now, here, let's say you have a diagonal line equal to y equals x. We would say the area under that is 0.5, and then that's equivalent to a totally random classifier. Alternatively, though, the closer you get to a classifier that moves up and to the right, the better it is. So again, an area equal to 0 is perfectly wrong, and equal to 1 is perfect. Now let's look at precision recall. This is a very similar idea, except this time we've got recall on the x-axis and we've got precision on the y-axis. Again, we essentially measure how well the classifier balances these two. Similarly, area of one is perfect and area of zero is perfectly wrong. Now, there are a few key differences between this one and the ROC curve, starting with when you prefer one versus the other. You'll go with the precision recall curve when you have imbalanced data because the ROC curve is going to be a little deceptively high. And also, an area under the precision recall curve equal to random guessing isn't equal to 0.5. Instead, it's just equal to the prevalence. That's just the percentage of observations in the minority class. All right, so now that we've talked about what all the different binary classification metrics are and given some intuition behind them, we're gonna switch over to Anaconda and we're going to see how all of these can be implemented in Python. So as always, we're going to be working with the Pima Indian Diabetes data set, but I'm actually gonna start here right at the beginning with the packages we're importing. We're using scikit-learn and from the metrics, there are a lot of functions we need to import here but we'll see them get put to good use. But anyway, I've already configured my setup to have the Kaggle API key stored locally in a place where it can be found, so I'm going to use that API to download this data set. I do that, we're good to go. Now notice, it's already very clean. We've got eight features here. They're all numeric, so we don't have to worry about any kind of data transformation here. And we've got our target variable, which of course is one or zero. So we're ready to get right into it. I'm going to separate my features from the response into X and Y. I'm then going to use the train test split function to divide 20% of the data into testing data and 80% into training. And I'm just going to use a super simple logistic regression model for calculating these metrics. Now, you could probably improve on a bunch of them by switching to something like a random forest or an XG boost. But even if you were to do that, a logistic regression is a totally reasonable starting point and baseline. So next you see we get YPRED and YPRED PROBA. So the difference between these two is that YPRED is binary. One if the model predicts diabetes and zero otherwise. YPRED PROBA, on the other hand, returns the probabilities of the positive outcome. 
Now, I think it's a pretty good practice to take a look at this because especially with imbalanced data, sometimes the probas can look a little wonky. So at least inspect to make sure that you have a nice balance there. But after that, let's go ahead and make a confusion matrix. So here we have 78 cases with no diabetes that were correctly predicted as no bot diabetes, and 37 cases with diabetes that were correctly predicted as diabetic. Similarly, 21 cases without diabetes were predicted as diabetic, and 18 cases with diabetes were missed. So given this, you have enough information to calculate a lot of these metrics by hand and to get a feel for how your classifier is doing, but let's systematically get all of them. Our recall, that is our sensitivity, is about 0.673. Again, you could validate this or figure this out yourself because it's just equal to 37 plus the sum of 37 plus 18, percentage of diabetic cases that our model correctly detected. I'm not going to go through that same exercise with all of these, but we can keep going. Precision is about 0.638, specificity is equal to 0.78 repeating, and accuracy is equal to 0.747. And we could get F1 score, which is around 0.655. Now down here is where we get to the really fun stuff. We use these ROC curve and precision recall curve functions, which are going to return three objects each. We're going to pass these below to matplotlib to actually visualize these. But before that, just use these ROC, AUC score, and average precision score functions to calculate the areas under these curves. Then we just work out matplotlib magic, and bam, we've got two curves plotted. So you see with the ROC curve, we've got a reference line at y equals x, so we can easily see how much better we're doing. And yeah, at an AUC of 0.81, this model performs extremely reasonably. However, it doesn't tell the whole story because we look to the right at the precision recall curve and we see the area under that is 0.71. Now, here we mentioned our class imbalance is about 72 to 28. And again, that's really borderline, like it's not the worst class imbalance ever, but this is a case where I think the precision recall curve is a bit more useful. It tells a slightly better story about our performance, in my opinion. So that about wraps up our discussion of these classification metrics. And now, in my opinion, the best way to tell a story about how well your classifier model is doing is really through a combination of the confusion matrix and the various curves. Because, as I hope you understand now, as one thing goes up, something else is going down, so you really need to tell a balanced story. Above and beyond that, the metrics that you should care about and prioritize are really most based on what's important to you and your stakeholders, real world considerations, and then also your class balance. So you should really ask the question before you make any model or perform any analysis, what is the purpose of this? And then metrics are just means to that end. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, smash the like button. If you didn't enjoy it, you're certainly free to hit the dislike button as well. Let me know down in the comments section, what do you think? What's your favorite classification metric and why? Then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard on Data.